perhaps I, I don't know how many of your audience are, are familiar with with ayahuasca, which means the vine of souls, and uh, and and what it is. Um, but uh, it has influenced the work of many uh, artists working in the medium of painting uh, around the world. And uh, while I'm not a painter, and I'm really quite quite useless at at painting and drawing things. My my particular gift, such as it is, is in the is in the field of writing, and and I definitely received a a, a strong uh, creative uh, boost from from working with ayahuasca, and uh, a whole a whole new line of of thinking opened up for me, and that resulted in in the first novel, uh, in Entangled, which was published in 2010. And uh, and now in in War God, and it occurs to me that some ideas are simply so extraordinary that they cannot uh, adequately be covered in the realm of non-fiction, where what you're presenting to your audience is uh, is facts, uh, and and that when you when you present a story as fact, there are certain conventions that you have to follow, uh, and particularly if your story is a controversial one, I found as the years went by and as academic uh, responses to my works of nonfiction grew more hostile because in the nonfiction realm, what I, was, what I was suggesting was that there could have been a lost civilization more than 12,000 years ago. And this is an idea that's very annoying to many archaeologists who are, con who are convinced that civilization you know, is not more than 5,000 years old. It suggested that they'd got something wrong. Uh, and I, my, my nonfiction works were very controversial, I think it's fair to say, and, and came in for a lot of attacks and criticism. And this made me very defensive in my writing and made me bulletproof every argument and have large numbers, sometimes as many as 2,000 footnotes annexed to my increasingly lengthy nonfiction books, so that uh, so that these attacks could be forestalled, uh, and it's just an incredible freedom to be able to explore the extraordinary ideas that interest me in the realm of fiction, uh, because then there is no there is no need to um, put up uh, a, a massively reinforced defensive argument. One can simply go ahead and say what one wants to say uh, and there is no there, there is no no possibility of um, you know furious critics attacking the book for being factually incorrect since one is not pretending that it is factually correct one is one's posture in writing a novel is that this is a work of fiction this is a work of fantasy uh, but what I've but what I've found is that it's possible to put uh, a huge amount of factual information into the fiction, into the fictional context, and at the same time, explore it in extraordinary and interesting ways. And this is why, uh, rather than writing a non-fiction book about the Spanish conquest of Mexico, I wrote War God, uh, which is a novel and and which uh, is also a work of fantasy, even though it is underpinned throughout by uh, facts of history. Uh, because there there was an extraordinary uh, element that I wished to explore in this story, which really would have been quite impossible to explore in nonfiction, and and that is um, the question of the spiritual forces that are at work uh, behind history. Uh, it, it, it is a simple fact that both uh, Hernan Cortez, who was the the Spanish conquistador, uh, who led the conquest of Mexico and his uh, opponent, Moctezuma, the emperor of the Aztecs, were both men who believed that they were in contact with supernatural forces. I mean, this is, this is a historical fact, but it's, um, a modern uh, critical academic would look at those beliefs of Cortes and Moctezuma and say that they were deluded that they were, because of course, from the, the point of view of modern academic criticism, there are no such things as supernatural forces. But I wanted to consider the possibility that Moctezuma and Cortes were not deluded, uh, and that when they had their uh, encounters with specific uh, supernatural entities, there was a reality 
to those supernatural entities. And in the case of Moctezuma, that entity was the god who the Aztecs called Huitzilopochtli, which means hummingbird at the left hand of the sun. And he was the war god of the Aztecs. And uh, Moctezuma, uh, and, and again, this is, this is his historical fact, uh, believed himself to be in daily communication with this entity, whatever this entity was. And those communications were facilitated by the consumption on Moctezuma's part of psilocybin mushrooms, which put him into a, a, a deep a visionary state. And in those trance states, he encountered this entity, this war god, who drove him on to acts of incredible violence and cruelty uh, and, and, and specifically a kind of almost serial killer delight in human, sac in human sacrifice, which was uh, a core uh, function of ritual in Aztec society. Uh, the Aztec society was extremely bloodthirsty and, and human sacrifices were carried out in honor of the war god, sometimes on a, an, an incredibly massive scale. There were, there were 40, uh, sorry, 80,000 people were sacrificed uh, at the inauguration. Yeah, I mean, it's just an unbelievable amount. The lines of sacrificial victims stretched stretched more than a mile to each of the four stairways of the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan. And um, uh, these, uh, these victims were, were being sacrificed to inaugurate that pyramid. This was some 30 or 40 years before the reign of Moctezuma uh, with a previous Aztec emperor who was also in touch with this entity uh, that they believed was their, their god of war. Um, on the other side, Hernan Cortez uh, was uh, in dreams uh, in contact with an entity that he believed was St. Peter. Uh, St. Peter had been the patron saint of Cortez since his childhood and um, played a key role in his life. And, and what I'm showing in, in War God is that these dream encounters with the entity that he construed as St. Peter uh, also led Cortez to commit acts of extraordinary wickedness and violence, which he believed he was doing or persuaded himself he was doing in the name of God. Some, in some ways, a great deal worse. This is, this, is the, this is the intriguing thing. So, I mean, to give away a bit of the plot, and, but also to, to help listeners to understand why I decided to write this in fi as fiction, because it allows an incredibly rich exploration of the implications of these supernatural encounters, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the, the demonic entity that appeared to Moctezuma as the war god of the Aztecs, in another disguise, because these entities are shapeshifters, appeared to Cortez as Saint Peter, and uh, that the purpose of demons throughout human history has been to maximize uh, the misery of the human race uh, and to make things much darker and worse than they might otherwise be. And that's what we see in the events between 1519 and 1521 when the Spanish conquest of Mexico unfolded, that these two leaders, uh, driven into frenzies of cruelty by their supernatural visionary encounters with these, with these entities, multiplied and magnified human misery on an extraordinary scale uh, in the Valley of Mexico. And while things were terribly bad under the Aztecs, they ultimately became a thousand, a hundred thousand times worse under the Spanish. And it's just another of those facts of history that the population of Mexico declined from an estimated 30 million in 1519 on the eve of the conquest to less than 1 million uh, barely 40 years later after the Spanish had taken control. So a gigantic genocide took place in, in that area. Events of terrible darkness unfolded and this is the stage, this is the frame in which I set the story of War God. And it is not a story of unremitting misery and, and horror because what redeems the story are the positive characters within it, both amongst the, amongst the Native Americans and amongst the Spaniards, and their capacity for love and courage and human decency uh, in a time of darkness.
I mean, writing writing novels is uh, is, is to a large extent uh, about character uh, and 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 also about plot. Now, now in this case, the essential the essential plot is is already provided by uh, history, uh, and it's a, and it's a plot uh, just so extraordinary that you literally couldn't make it up. I mean, what happened in those two years between 1519 and and 15. 21 was on an uh, on an on an epic scale and and it involved the collision of two cultures and it changed the face of the world and and what took place at that time was just literally incredible uh, so so I'm able to 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 draw from the historical events to give a plot that is very real and based on events that actually happened but but that are yet uh, extraordinary as to characters there are many historical characters, true historical characters, who play key roles uh, in my in my story, such as Cortez himself, such as uh, Moctezuma, and such as an extraordinary woman called Malinal, uh, who is is a known historical figure. She actually be, she 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 actually became the mistress of uh, Cortez uh, in in Mexico. Um, but for some, she she is a Native American woman, and her origins are somewhat obscure. But the, her key characteristic, what made her, what allowed her to become important in history, is that she spoke uh, two languages. She spoke Maya, uh, the language of the Yucatan Peninsula, where the ancient Mayan uh, civilization flourished, and 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 where, where indeed there are still Maya-speaking people today. And she also spoke Nahuatl, which was the language of the Aztecs. And Nahuatl is also uh, spoken, still spoken today. Malinal uh, spoke both of these languages. And for some reason, which history does not provide us with the answer to, but which I was able to, uh, as a novelist, I was able to uh, make it comprehensible to the, to the reader why this was the case. For some, for, for some reason, Malinal had a huge grudge against Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor. Um, and w w w what we know of Malinal from, from history that was that she was, she was born into an aristocratic family, but that her, uh, and her father was a, was a minor king uh, of, of uh, an outlying uh, group of people, not in the center of the Aztec empire, but in an outlying area. And that she was, um, she would have been the successor of that king, but the king died, and her when when Malinal was still a child, and Malinal's mother remarried another man and had a child, a male child by him, and they decided to get rid of Malinal, uh, so that that male child would uh, would have the inheritance, and she was sold into slavery. Uh, this is this is historical fact. Um, well, in my in my novel, um, I have her uh, effectively a, a, a sex slave for the Aztecs as a young woman, and then through a series of events, prepared for human sacrifice. And this was very common in Aztec society. So we first encounter her in what are called the fattening pens um, in Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan was the capital of the Aztec Empire, and it stands on the site of what is now Mexico City. Um, in those days, in 1519, Tenochtitlan actually stood on an island uh, in the midst of a great lake called Lake Texcoco, and it was approached by causeways, sometimes as much as six miles long, crossing the waters of that, of that lake. Today, of course, Mexico City has no lake. It's, the whole lake has been drained, but this is the, the location of Tenochtitlan. So we encounter Malinal in the fattening pen. This is where, again, this is another gruesome feature of Aztec society that when people were to be sacrificed, they would first of all fatten them up uh, so that they would be in the Aztec concept, very strange, so that they would be desirable to the god uh, before they were led up the pyramid and their hearts were brutally cut out of their chests. Uh, and, and this is where we meet Malinal waiting for her, waiting for her death, um, having fallen foul of the, of the high priest uh, who used her for sex, which was against his vows because the, the high priests of the Aztecs were supposed to be celibate. There, as it were, the official accounts of the Aztecs as to, as to why they were killing people on the execution stone. 
Um, part of it is to do with a belief that the end of the world was imminent. Um, and that in order to prevent the end of the world, and specifically the death of the, the death of the sun, uh, with whom the war god Witzelopochtli was intimately associated, uh, they would offer up the vital force of human hearts and blood to rejuvenate and uh, nourish and maintain the sun for another day or another year. Um, but if you go deeper, you find that that, that there are constant references to these visionary encounters with entities who are urging the Aztecs to murder and kill in, in this way. Uh, and, and without those visionary encounters, it's difficult to imagine that they would ever have gone down this, this road. So, so th this, is, this is the reason for it, and this is why uh, I think it's a, it, it's, it's a very interesting story to, to tell. Um, if I could come back to the issue of, of Malinal, my, my, and she is one of the two heroines of my story. We meet her in the fattening pens with a, with, in the company of another young woman, a young, a young witch with supernatural powers which are not yet fully developed, called Tozi, who's also going to be sacrificed. And to cut a long story short, they, they escape uh, from, the, um, from the, sacrif the, the sacrificial predicament. And while Tozi stays in Tenochtitlan to work harm against Moctezuma, Malinal goes to the coast. And the reason she goes to the coast is because there was a belief at that time, and again, this is one of the mysterious aspects of the story that you just couldn't make up. Um, and it's very, very much a historical fact. There was a belief at that time that a god of peace called Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, would be returning uh, to Mexico, having been driven out long before in some distant epoch by the forces uh, of evil and darkness, uh, that this god of peace, Quetzalcoatl, who was completely against human sacrifice, would be returning and that he would return in the year in the, in the Aztec calendar that was called One Reed. The Aztec calendar is rather like the Chinese calendar. I think everybody's familiar with the, the Chinese calendar and the fact that there are 12 named years, you know, the year of the rat, the year of the snake, the year of the tiger, and so on and so forth. Um, and and uh, it was very similar with the Aztec calendar, except it wasn't 12 named years, it was 52 named years, and they, they revolved in a great cycle. Uh, and in a year one read, not uh, specified in which cycle it would occur, there was a prophecy that the god Quetzalcoatl would return uh, to abolish human sacrifice and to overthrow a wicked king. And it just happened that at exactly uh, the, the, the time that the Spanish conquest began, it was the year one read. 1519 was the year one read. Well, in a way, in a way he came back, but in a, but in a terrible, dark, vengeful, violent form. And, and I think if there's, you know, if there's anything that we in the modern age can learn from all of this, it is because there has been much talk, uh, there was much talk around the 21st of December 2012 uh, of a rebirth of human consciousness and of the return of Quetzalcoatl again, uh, that, we, that we don't need to make the mistakes that our ancestors made. And we don't need to repeat the cycle of violence and wickedness that has been has been imposed upon the human race. Uh, but at any rate, Malinar went to the coast in hope that she would encounter this god of peace and that she would be able to uh, work with him to bring about the end of this awful regime of human sacrifice. And, and the, the, lo and behold, when she, when she gets to the coast, and again, this is historical fact, she's, she's actually taken prison, prisoner by the Maya um, and this is at exactly the time that Cortez uh, arrives in Mexico with 490 men. And, and again, here you have, you have a scenario that, that it would be impossible to make up. The Aztecs have a standing army of 200,000 men. They are uh, an extraordinarily brutal mil militaristic power. They are like Hitler's Germany in Mexico uh, in the 16th century. They're a war machine, and on their coast arrive 11 ships containing 490 Spaniards. And at first, the odds seem 
absolutely insuperable. How can, how can such a tiny group of men possibly hope to overthrow uh, an empire on this scale? I have to, I have to say that, that, that I have many reservations about the Spaniards. Um, they were extremely negative and cruel in many ways, but they were also men of their time. And we have to remember that in those times, in the 16th century, uh, ethics uh, were completely different from, from ethics today. In those times, might was right. If you had the force, if you had the power, then you used it to take from others. And that was not considered to be wrong. It was just the way things, the way things were and the way they had been uh, for, a very, for a very long time. Uh, and, and, and I have to pay tribute to the astonishing courage uh, of, of these, this small group of Spaniards uh, who turn up on this hostile coast, not really knowing exactly what it is they're going to confront, but pretty soon finding out what it is. And they first of all uh, make contact with the Maya. They land on the island of Cozumel, a well-known holiday resort today. And uh, they, 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 they then sail round, round the, the thumb of the Yucatan and come down on, on the Tabasco River. And that's where Cortez has his first major uh, military encounter. And, and I show in the book that he's driven on to seek out this encounter by his visionary encounters with the entity that he construes as, as St. Peter, who is demonic, uh, who is the same entity, in fact, that is misleading Moctezuma. Uh, and, and there, Cortez confronts a gigantic Mayan army of at least 50,000 men. Um, and, you know, the odds seem absolutely insuperable. How could he, how could he possibly hope to win that battle? Uh, he has no allies whatsoever. There's just him and his 490 Spaniards. But they have a number of advantages. They have um, something quite incomprehensible to the indigenous people. They have dogs that are used as weapons of war. They have a hundred wolfhounds and mastiffs with them. And these dogs are trained to kill. Uh, and they dress them up in armor. Uh, so they, they're huge, savage killer dogs. And they have a, they have a, a hundred of those dressed in, in shining armor of metal plate and chain mail. Um, and and there were, dogs were known in Central America, but there was no dog larger than the Chihuahua. These dogs in Central America were used as food items. Uh, and they didn't, have, they didn't even bark. Uh, so, so the only concept of the dog that was there in Central America was of this passive uh, food animal, the food item, that, about the, the size of a Chihuahua. Uh, so in, initially when they saw the Spanish war dogs, they had no idea what they were dealing with. They, they thought they were some sort of dreadful supernatural being. They described them as dragons, actually. And then secondly, the Spanish had another colossal advantage, and that was a small corps of cavalry. Uh, horses had been extinct in the, in the New World for more than 12,000 years when Cortez turned up. There had been horses in the Americas, but they went extinct at the end of the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. So there was no memory whatsoever of horses or what horses were. Uh, the Spanish had with them 16 heavy horse, 16 um, destriers, these, these massive horses that were, that were used for cavalry charges. And again, the horses as well as the men were armored. Uh, in steel. Uh, so you have to picture this, this huge, huge horse, uh, which is covered in, in gleaming steel. And on its back is mounted a warrior with, steel, with a steel sword dressed in steel armor. And in the eyes of the Maya who first encountered this cavalry, they just had absolutely no idea what they were dealing with. They could not place it in any frame of reference. They understood that the horses looked somewhat like deer, um, and, and the men were mounted upon their backs. Now, were the men sitting on the deer, or was this some, some kind of extraordinary supernatural hybrid, hybrid creature that they were encountering, which was like a centaur, which was part, 
you know, part deer. Anthropomorphic. And, and, uh, uh, exactly, and, and part man. They, they, just, they just weren't sure. And then the speed of these things, that they come charging down at you in a, in a close-knit group at about 30 miles an hour with their hooves thundering on the ground and making, and making the earth tremble, and mounted upon them these, these, these warriors with lances, uh, again, steel-tipped, steel-tipped lances. This was just a shocking, terrifying sight to the Maya. And they had no tactics to deal with it. European armies had been uh, dealing with cavalry charges. European infantry had been dealing with caval cavalry charges for you know, thousands of years. And they had developed very specific tactics to deal with cavalry charges. The Maya had no such tactics. They were thrown into utter disarray. And then the third thing that gave the Spanish, uh, another thing that gave the Spanish an advantage was the possession of guns. Um, and these guns were of two types. They had a very primitive musket called the arquebus. Uh, it took about a minute to reload and fire uh, each shot with that. They had about 50 of those with them. And they had cannon, a number of small cannon called falconets, uh, and a number of larger cannon called lombards. Uh, these also were totally unknown weapons in the Americas. They had never seen anything like a firearm, but they did have traditions of the gods having a weapon that were called fire serpents, uh, which dismembered and destroyed men and made loud noises and emitted clouds of smoke, uh, which was exactly what the guns did. So in every way, this Spanish force looked like a supernatural force to those who first, who first met them. Uh, and as a result, in that first big battle at Potonchan, uh, Cortes was able, it wasn't easy, the Maya were not cowards, even though they were confronting this, this most unusual and, and terrifying spectacle. Mm -hmm. uh, the Maya put up a, a, a massive fight, and for a while it looked as though Cortes' infantry would be destroyed, but then he came into the battle uh, from from behind with his cavalry and and at the same time the war gods were the, the war dogs were unleashed and uh, suddenly the whole Mayan force collapsed into a into a rout uh, and you have to imagine cannon firing grape shot whistling amongst their ranks these huge cannonballs from the Lombards bouncing along destroying 100 200 men at a time just an absolutely shattering experience and and in the end Cortez carried the day. Um, they, and they were, this is the other difference between them and the forces they faced in, in Central America, is that for them, uh, warfare was a science, and they had, they had carefully thought out tactics. And these were, these were all hardened men. Uh, Spain, you have to remember, had just gone through 700 years of conflict with, um, with Islam. Uh, Spain had been had been occupied by Arab forces, large parts of Spain, and, and there took place a, a campaign called the Reconquista, where the Spanish gradually reconquered their, their territory from Arab occupation. And this had ended, the final battle of the Reconquista was not long before the conquest of Mexico. So these men were hardened in warfare. They'd also had experience of war in Italy in the Italian wars, and um, so, the, so they, were a, they were a hardened, formidable force who knew exactly what they were doing and who did not break or panic easily, uh, and who counted upon one another and who counted upon their skills and their tactics, and, and whose whole objective in warfare was to utterly destroy the enemy on the battlefield with just ruthless, single-minded focus. Whereas both for the Maya and the Aztecs, a battle was a place to take prisoners uh, who would then be carried off and at a later date sacrificed. So uh, their tactics in warfare were, were actually not really to kill the enemy on the battlefield, but to disable the enemy and take them prisoner. And this cost them dear when they came up against the ruthless killing machine uh, of, the, of the Spaniards who had no such um, ideas at all, who were just there to utterly wipe them out. And, uh, and, that's what they, and that's what they did. So we have this giant battle at Potonchan, and then Cortes um, accepts the surrender of the Mayan chiefs. And this is where he encounters Malinal, the, the heroine who I spoke of earlier, because she'd been taken prisoner by the Maya on her way down to the coast, pursuing the dream of meeting the god of peace, Quetzalcoatl. And uh, 20 women were handed over by the Maya to Cortes to serve as um, cooks and, and servants and, and bed companions. And one of them was this woman, Malinal. Uh, 
and and uh, this is where she injects herself into history. Mm. She's the key, she's the key to the whole saga because without her, uh, it is very unlikely that Cortez would have succeeded in conquering the Aztecs. She gave Cortez key information which he needed, and she played a very key role. And this is recognized uh, to this day uh, in Mexico, where the name of Malinal, who's the heroine of my story, in Mexico today, Malinal is regarded as a traitor. Uh, if you uh, call somebody a Malinchist in Mexico, it's, a fa it's the equivalent to calling them a, a, a traitor, uh, because she was considered to have handed over her land and people uh, to the invaders. And um, she, has a, she has a bad reputation in Mexico today, which I hope my story will go some way towards rehabilitating because she was, she was an extraordinary, and I, I hope so. She was an extraordinary and remarkable character. Again, at any rate, sorry, I have to give the background to this. It's a little bit, it's a little bit lengthy, but uh, bear with me. When Cortez first landed in, in the Yucatan, he had an extraordinary, where, where everybody spoke the Mayan language, he had an extraordinary stroke of luck which was that a Spaniard had been shipwrecked there some 11 years before. And that Spaniard had been one of a group of 26, uh, 25 of whom were eaten, sacrificed and eaten by the Maya uh, because cannibalism was practiced throughout this region. But one uh, whose name was uh, Aguilar uh, was kept alive uh, in a rather humiliating role serving a Mayan chief. And this uh, Aguilar had been amongst the Maya for 11 years and thus spoke fluent Maya as well as Spanish. And when Cortez heard that there was somebody who looked a bit like him held prisoner in one of the Mayan villages, he went and grabbed this guy. And uh, Aguilar became Cortez's first interpreter. And in all his encounters with the Maya, uh, Aguilar did the, the key role of interpreting. And this was very important because Cortez was an incredibly cunning and clever man. And he used language, he used speech, he used the power of persuasion very effectively to secure his dominance. So having a good interpreter was really important to him. But after he dealt with the Maya and accepted their surrender and received these 20 women, amongst them Malinal, as, his, um, a, a, as a gift from the Maya, he moved on down the coast. He'd heard by then rumors of the, detailed rumors of the Aztecs, and they had something he wanted. The Aztecs had gold. It, it was gold that drove the Spanish conquest of Mexico more than anything else. And, and here's just one of those funny things. The Maya were not that interested in gold. The Maya liked jade. Jade was very important to them. For the Spanish, they just saw it as some kind of green stone that had no attraction to them. And they were a bit disappointed at the limited amounts of gold they managed to extract from the Maya after defeating them. But uh, there were these rumors of this huge empire which was rich in gold, and Cortez decided to go on and uh, take that empire on. So he sailed on down the coast, and he came to the first town that was part of the Aztec empire. And uh, he landed there and found himself in a position where he couldn't speak to them, because suddenly his interpreter, who spoke Maya, didn't speak a word of Nahuatl, the Aztec language. And they were getting along very badly with sign language and, and gestures when the woman Malinal, uh, who was carrying um, pots at that point and working in the kitchens, um, put herself forward and made it clear that she spoke both Maya and Nahuatl. And Cortes immediately grasped what this meant, that he could now speak to the Aztecs. He would give his words to Aguilar, the Spanish shipwreck, Aguilar would put them into the Mayan language to Malinal. Malinal would then translate them into Nahuatl so that the Aztecs could understand them. And the reverse process would occur. So with these two interpreters, Cortes could suddenly speak to the Aztecs. And again, this is a historical fact. Very quickly, uh, Malinal uh, learned the Spanish language and it was possible for her to dispense with Aguilar within a few months. She didn't need him anymore as an intermediary. She could speak Spanish directly to Cortez and serve as his, effectively as his tongue. And in every image now that we see of Cortez, and many have survived from the Aztec time because the Aztecs made a lot of paintings. In every image of him that has survived, we see Malinal standing by his side, and we see the glyph for speech coming out of her mouth, and, and she becomes his confidant, uh, his interpreter, and his lover.
and she also becomes his advisor. Uh, and this is where she gives him the key information that he's going to need in order to defeat Moctezuma. And that is the story of Quetzalcoatl, of the returning deity. Uh, and by some mystical process, by some extraordinary coincidence, Cortes and his army have turned up in the year one read when Quetzalcoatl was expected to return. And moreover, they look like Quetzalcoatl because there were these traditions amongst the Aztecs that Quetzalcoatl had, had been a white-skinned, bearded deity armed with formidable weapons who would come, who would return from across the seas in a boat that moved by itself without paddles. And Cortes and the Spanish, with their sailing ships, just perfectly fitted the bill. Uh, and and Malinal's advice to Cortes was that he should not pretend to be Quetzalcoatl. He should always say what he was, but he should leave it to the imaginations of the Aztecs to fill in the gaps. They would think he was Quetzalcoatl, whatever he said, because they regarded their gods as tricksters. Uh, and and this is what happened for the in, in the initial part of the encounter. Moctezuma was convinced that he was dealing with this returning deity. And Cortez, of course, was massively opposed to human sacrifice. Uh, and this was, again, what was expected of Quetzalcoatl, that he would be opposed to human sacrifice. The old legend said that he was a god who, who put his fingers in his ears at any talk of human sacrifice and who had ruled that people should only sacrifice flowers and never human hearts and blood. So, so Cortes, even though he was a warrior and a killer, and there's a famous um, song by Neil Young actually called Cortez the Killer, which, which um, you know, fits the bill perfectly because he was a, a, a ruthless, awesome predator. Um, he nevertheless was able to don this mantle of Quetzalcoatl and Moctezuma, who'd been carrying out horrific uh, human sacrifices at his own hands, began to feel that he, fit, that he himself, Moctezuma, fitted the bill of the prophecy as the wicked king who would be overthrown by Quetzalcoatl. And he felt somehow that his own wickedness was what explained the incredible cruelty and ferocity of the of the Spaniards, and it took it took Moctezuma and the Aztecs quite a long time to figure out for sure that they weren't actually dealing with gods at all. They were dealing with men just like them, but but formidably armed and and dangerous men. He had an incredible grip on this whole on this whole thing, and he was he was in many ways a remarkable man. Um, he was what you would call a Machiavellian. There was a you know, there was the, the, this sort of strategy of, um, of calculating leadership that had been proposed by an Italian uh, philosopher writer called Machiavelli, and, and um, Cortes fitted perfectly into, into that mold. He understood human nature. He knew how to manipulate. He knew how to seize every advantage. Um, and, and, and at the same time, uh, he was undoubtedly uh, courageous. So after he had acquired Malinal, after he could speak to the Aztecs, and after the Aztecs had been persuaded to start handing over presents of gold to him, this was another of the incredible mistakes that Moctezuma made. He hoped somehow, because Cortes is, fam is famously on record for saying, you know, we Spaniards suffer from a disease of the heart for which the only remedy is gold. They actually handed over huge quantities of gold to the Spanish as gifts in the hope that it would make the Spanish go away. Uh, but far from that, it incited the Spanish team because they thought, C Cortes thought, my God, you know, if you give us all this, then what have they got in their stores, you know? So, so we have to go to the Aztec capital and, uh, and grab all their gold. It just incited his, it just incited his greed uh, even, even further. Uh, at the same time, uh, he's playing this delicate game uh, of being understood to be a god while he knows perfectly well that he's a man. And he's getting a glimpse of the scale of the Aztec forces as these various embassies approach him. And he sees these backed up by, by huge armies. And, and Malinar makes it clear to him that the Aztecs are a gigantic military force. And other people they encounter are terrified of the Aztecs. The Aztecs preyed upon their neighbors. They, in order to fuel their engine of human sacrifice, 
they used neighboring tribes as farms, if you like, and they would go and, and, and attack them and take their young men and women and drag them off to Tenochtitlan to be, to be sacrificed. So everybody, for example, a people called the Totonacs, were in great fear of Moctezuma. And, and they communicated this fear to Cortez. And uh, obviously Cortez and, and, and Cortez and his men had, had seen already examples of human sacrifices taking place. Um, and initially with the Aztecs, when they witnessed this happening, they didn't intervene to stop it because they, they did not want to provoke a fight earlier than they were ready to have it. Um, and, and so they knew that they were dealing with a formidable enemy. And in this full knowledge, Cortes did an extraordinary thing just before he led the march into the highlands towards Mexico City. And this was that he destroyed his fleet. He had 11 ships, and of those 11 ships, he sank 10, um, scuttled them, and had them dismantled, and used the wood from the ships to build houses in a settlement that he created on the coast. Uh, and this uh, was done so that none of his men would have any illusions. They would not be going home. They would not be, they would not be sailing back to Cuba where they had come from because there had been a Spanish settlement in Cuba since the time of Columbus. They were going to conquer or die. It was a one-way ticket. So everybody of those 490 Spaniards, now their numbers added to by 100 sailors, making a force of just under 600 men, they all knew that their lives depended on success. They had to win because otherwise they would all die and their hearts would be cut out like those victims they had already seen that happening to. And in this spirit, they begin the march into the, into the highlands. And then the next thing happens. Uh, again, as I say, you couldn't make this up. And there are intriguing... Uh, as well as, as Malinal and, and the other young woman in my story who are the heroines, heroines of my story, Tozi, there is a, a, a Native American chief uh, belonging to a people called the, Tlas, the Tlaxcalans, and his name is Shikotenka, and he is also a, a true historical figure who plays a heroic role in my story. Uh, the Tlaxcalans were one of those peoples who the Aztecs used as a farm for human sacrifices. And they were uh, repeatedly, for 100, 200 years, they'd been victimized by the Aztecs. And they'd somehow preserved their independence. They were very brave. They fought back. But they were usually defeated by the Aztecs because the Aztecs had much larger forces. And the Aztecs would take away their young men and women for, for sacrifice year in, year out, like some sort of mythical monster. And uh, the Tlaxcalans fought back. Now, you would have expected, and Cortes expected, because he knew that Tlaxcalans were the enemies of the Aztecs, he expected that they would become his automatic and immediate allies, uh, that he would be able to use them uh, easily to attack the Aztecs. But that's not quite what happened, because the leader of the Tlaxcalans, uh, a man called, as I mentioned, Shikotenka, uh, was a, truly a heroic character. And he, when he saw the Spaniards, he didn't believe this stuff about gods for a minute. He knew they were men. He knew they were buccaneers and pirates and just, just in it for gain. And he looked at them and he looked at the way they behaved and he saw the future of Mexico. He saw that if they won, then not only the Aztec culture would go down, but that every culture in Mexico would go down and the whole world would never be the same again. And so for that reason, he actually fought Cortes, uh, even though it was against his interests to do so. And, and he fought him with incredible courage and almost, almost fought him into the ground. It was, there was an extraordinary series of battles in the, in the highlands uh, on the way between the coast and Mexico City, between Cortes and the, and the Tlaxcalans. And uh, Cortes used every resource at his command, his cavalry. And, and by the way, there's an extraordinary incident where one of the Spanish cavalry, one of the Spanish horses was actually decapitated by a Tlaxcalan warrior. Uh, the, the, neither the Aztecs nor the Tlaxcalans had uh, metal weapons. They used stone weapons. Um, and their particular weapon of choice was a kind of wooden sword with flakes of obsidian uh, embedded in its edges. It was called a macuahuitl, this weapon. And it was a fearsome weapon, actually. And it happened that the horse was not wearing armor on its neck. 
And in a single blow, one of the Tlaxcalan warriors decapitated it using this obsidian-edged wooden broadsword, which uh, again made it quite clear that these animals were not supernatural. They could be killed. Um, and tremendous battles took place. And, and Cortes, again, as I show in the book, um, ad, ad, advised by the demonic entity that he believes is St. Peter, uh, carried out horrendous massacres against uh, Tlaxcalan villages and towns. And it was only by the process of these cruel massacres, <coughs> plus some extraordinary victories in battle against large Tlaxcalan armies, that finally the, the Senate of Tlaxcala forced Xicotenca, the chief, to submit to Cortes and to, and to say, enough is enough, we cannot fight this man. If they had only known, Cortes uh, was, in, uh, was within a day of giving up at that point, because, because the, the, that close, the Tlaxcalan resistance had been, had been so powerful. And the, and the call amongst his men was to give up, retreat to the coast as, as, as fast as possible, send the one remaining ship to Cuba, and, and get, get, get some ships over to get us out of there. And this was, this was very much in the minds of the Spaniards at that point, but the Cortes' strategy worked, and the, and the Toscalans gave up before the Spaniards did. And suddenly then, Cortes was um, welcomed into the city of Tlaxcala, and uh, he suddenly has 100,000 uh, Tlaxcalan auxiliaries who are serving him, and who have a historical enmity against the Aztec, Aztecs. And Xicotenca comes over and becomes effectively one of Cortes' generals uh, in the next uh, unfolding uh, element of the drama. This was, this was karma that happened to Moctezuma. The Spaniards were a kind of instant karma because uh, if Moctezuma had been a different kind of leader, if he had not behaved with such cruelty to neighboring peoples, <laughs> if he had not carried out these wicked acts of human sacrifice and been hated by every culture around him, then instead of... Um, Cortes being able to win allies as he went along, uh, he would have been met by a united opposition and uh, very easily stopped. Uh, but it was Cortes's ultimate success in bringing the Tlaxcalans over to his side, and he had to fight for it, but he did succeed, um, that was key in the defeat of Moctezuma. And the Tlaxcalans were not alone. Other, other peoples also, also backed the, the, the Spaniards in the hope that they would get rid of these horrific tyrants called the, called the Aztecs. I feel that I'm learning. Um, I, in a way, I, you know, I'm 62 years old now, and I've been, I've been writing non-fiction all my, all my working life. Uh, I was originally a journalist, but I started writing books in... My first book was a travel book about Pakistan, actually, published in 1981. And, and um, I went on from there to write many, many, many non-fiction books. And also in the process of writing non-fiction, one learns as one goes along, you know. You, 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 get, you get better at it. It's like, it's like anything like um, uh, running or, or singing, you know. Um, any skill, the more you practice it, hopefully the better you get. And uh, with, with fiction, I, I think it's the same. I've learned, I've learned a lot about storytelling. I've always felt that I was first and foremost a storyteller. And that that's what I was doing even in nonfiction. Um, the, the, the basic drive of a narrative, a, a story that will, that will engage the reader, that the reader will, will become involved in and want to continue turning the pages on, that is common between, that is shared between nonfiction and fiction. Um, and, and, uh, but, but then in fiction you have these additional elements of, of uh, character and plot, and the very definite need for a story to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. There has to be a structure there. Um, and um, yes, I've, I've definitely learned about this. I, 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 my, my first novel was Entangled, uh, and I, I, had to, I had to really work, work through all the dynamics of fiction writing while I was, while I was writing that, and, and all the lessons that I learned from writing that I've been able to apply to the War God story. Um, the publishing industry thinks in terms of brands, you know, because publishing these days isn't run by editors anymore. It's run by marketing men. And marketing men don't think in terms of good stories. They think in terms of brands. And they see me as a, as a non-fiction brand. Um, I detest being put in a box like that. Uh, but but, uh, but that's, how, that's how I've seen. So I've had very little support from 
the world of publishing. I mean, my 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 UK publisher, who are Hodder and Stout, and they they accept that I'm writing novels, and they they're they're happy to publish my novels, but they don't put a lot of energy or effort into it because they feel they feel that somehow you know it won't work because my audience are used to reading me as a non-fiction author, and are unlikely to go and pick up my my novels as well. Um, so it's up to me. Uh, to do to do the work and make the effort uh, to to persuade my existing audience that my fiction is worth taking a look at, um, and 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 also uh, you know hopefully to reach a, a new audience who only read read fiction and have never read nonfiction books, and it's, so it it is like completely reinventing myself in my sixties. Um, like, in a way, it's like starting again. It's like starting a, 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 a new career. I think it's very exciting. I, I love it. I feel very, I feel very, yeah, I feel very positive about it, and I'm, and I welcome the challenge, and I'm glad to have the privilege and the opportunity to be able to do this, and to, and to, you know, to take these these risks, if you like, with my career, uh, and in 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 order to express myself, uh, express myself creatively, and and do what I feel what I feel called to do. Uh, it's a great opportunity, and 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 a nice change of direction for me and I love writing fiction it's you know when I watch kids playing computer games I'm a bit like that when I'm writing fiction I'm I get I get lost in the world that I'm describing and writing about I just I immerse myself into that uh, that epoch that this this period okay we're talking 1519 to 1521 it's coming up to 500 years ago quite quite near to 500 years ago um, the Spaniards at that time were literate and um, many of them kept journals and afterwards wrote accounts. Uh, another one of my, uh, I have heroic characters amongst the Spaniards as well as villains. And I have heroic characters uh, on the Native American side as well as villains. And one of my heroic Spanish characters is a known historical figure who was a soldier called Bernal Diaz. And uh, Bernal Diaz was a young man at the beginning of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. He was in his early 20s, and he fought his way through the whole conquest, and he lived to a ripe old age. He lived, he lived actually well into his 80s. And as an old man, he, he had kept a journal when, when the conquest was taking place, and as an old man, he sat down and turned that journal into, into a book, um, which was Bernard Diaz's the, the Conquest of New Spain. And he and he, he turned that uh, into a lengthy book, which describes in detail all of his experiences uh, during the conquest. Um, and and uh, it's a sad story in a way, Ben Ben Adiz, because he he says that he he made no money out of the conquest. He never became a rich man. Uh, and and he 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 said at the end of his life that this is the only thing that I have to leave to my children are these these memoirs that I've that I've recorded. And in fact, his his journal, his his book, uh, vanished for about 150 years, and eventually the manuscript copy was found in a library in Spain, and uh, circulated after that. So there's a detailed first-hand account, and there are many others. Many of the other conquistadors kept first-hand accounts and later published books. So I've got a whole a whole lot of first-hand, what you would call primary historical sources, from the Spanish point of view on the conquest of Mexico. And then the Aztecs also kept records uh, and wrote accounts. <coughs> the Aztecs were also a literate culture. And there were friars um, who came with the Spaniards and remained on after the conquest was over, who made a point of learning the Nahuatl language and translating um, Aztec accounts, whether verbal or written, uh, into Spanish. So, so um, it, you, what I've been able to find is that in some cases the same battle is intimately described by both sides, and uh, you have a huge amount of detail there to draw on uh, and and to you know to serve as a resource for for the novel playground of research and and you know there's a there's a surprising document I'm 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 looking at at you know three or four shelves of books that I own. Uh, on the the single subject of the Spanish conquest of Mexico, Cortez's secretary, for example, kept uh, gave, gave an account. Uh, there were many, many, many accounts. Cortez himself wrote uh, detailed letters running to hundreds of thousands of words in the end, 
um, because his part of his Machiavellian campaign was to win the support of the Spanish king. See, Cortes, when he mounted the conquest, uh, he was undertaking an illegal operation. Um, Cortes led the conquest from Cuba, where there, the Spanish had been, as I mentioned earlier, since the time of Columbus. And Cuba was, was um, governed by a man called Diego Velazquez. And Diego Velazquez uh, and Cortes had a strained history. And there was a point where Diego Velazquez had thrown Cortes in prison uh, to do with a woman who Diego Velazquez favored, who Cortes had made pregnant but was refusing to marry. Um, and uh, eventually Cortes agreed to marry her and was released from prison. And then, it's the, then he seems to have, uh, he clearly didn't like Diego Velazquez at all, but he sweet-talked Velazquez into giving him command of the expedition that would go to what they called the New Lands, which was Mexico, to mount the, the conquest. And Velazquez put some of his own money into that, and Cortes got his fleet of 11 ships together, always intending to take it away from Velazquez. Velazquez got wind of this, and uh, sent men to arrest Cortez again, but Cortez's own spies reported this to him. And on a, an incredible night, he sailed without the permission of Velazquez. As Velazquez was coming to arrest him, he ordered, Cortez ordered the fleet to sail. And they, all, they sailed from Santiago to Cuba, and the, the conquest began. So he, he had set out without the permission of his governor. It would be a very difficult situation for him. And, and secondly, then, he needed, to, he needed to legitimize what he had done. And the only way to legitimize that was by success and to uh, win the support of the king of Spain, who could overrule the governor of Cuba. So Cortes wrote these enormous letters to the, to the king of Spain, and those letters uh, form an amazing resource uh, for anybody wanting to study the Spanish conquest of Mexico. And I've, I've drawn on them extensively. And again, you can see the Machiavellian mind of Cortes at work. He threw everything into the pot. And one of the things he threw into the pot uh, was that just before they began the march into the highlands to take on the Aztecs seriously, by which time they had already received huge presents of gold from the Aztecs. Uh, he, uh, I, I told you that he burnt his ships. One was left on the coast of Cuba, um, and one was sent to Spain. And that ship that was sent to Spain contained all the gold that they'd been given so far as a gift to the Spanish king, which was designed to bribe him um, to, to take Cortez's side, which eventually he did. And Cortez is the man whose name goes down in history. He talks, uh, and, and Velazquez uh, was ruined, actually, in, in the end, because Velazquez did an extraordinary thing. Okay, so let me, just, let me just return to the story for a moment. Cortez defeats the Tlaxcalans, and he then has his allies. He has 100,000 Tlaxcalan auxiliaries. Malinal is by his side, and they continue the march towards Mexico City. On the way, they come to a, a, a city called Cholula, and there, which is under the, which is uh, an Aztec city, and there, they conduct the most horrific massacre. Five thousand citizens of Cholula are murdered by the Spaniards, and this is done coldly and calculatedly by Cortez to send a message to Moctezuma. The message is: if you oppose me, this is what will happen to you. They then march on, and they come to the shores of the lake in which Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, stands. And Moctezuma, by this point, is a quivering wreck, despite his huge armies. He's just terrified of Cortez. He still believes Cortez is a god, although he, there are others on his council who are advising him clearly that Cortez is a man. Mo Moctezuma can't make up his mind. So what he decides to do, rather than fight Cortez, is to invite Cortez into Mexico City. And there he thinks to himself, once I have these, one, these gods, if they are gods, or men, if they are men, inside my city, then if I choose to do so, I can massacre them. Because Mexico City, Tenochtitlan at that time, as I mentioned, is in a lake. You get into it along causeways, and the bridges on the causeways can be removed. 
so there would be no possibility of the Spanish fleeing the city. And uh, th so this is what happens in November of 1519, is that Cortes and his little army, most of the Tlaxcalans are obliged to stay outside, are invited into Mexico City. There's an amazing encounter with Moctezuma where, where Malinal does the interpreting and famously stares Moctezuma straight in the face. No woman had ever done that. And it, this is partly what, what tells us about her feelings, her hatred towards Moctezuma. Um, and in go the Spaniards, and they're given uh, the palace of Moctezuma's father as their headquarters, right in the heart of Mexico City, in front of the Great Pyramid, where the human sacrifices are taking place daily. And they can see exactly what they're up against. And this is where C Cortes pulls off an amazing masterstroke, which is that after four days inside Mexico City, forestalling the likelihood that the Aztecs will attack him, he marches over to Moctezuma's palace and takes the emperor of the Aztecs hostage. He just takes him prisoner. And, and he says to him, you'll do what I say or I will kill you. And it, of course, this is translated through this, through this woman, Malinal. And amazingly, Moctezuma, who's, who, whose own guards are in place, who is all around there, crumbles. And he, and he accepts the status of hostage. And he accepts to be taken back to the palace he'd given to the Spaniards. And there he becomes their puppet. And for the next six months, this is where Cortes almost pulled off a bloodless coup. He really was so close to doing it. Moctezuma was his puppet. He was, Cortes was ruling the Aztec Empire through Moctezuma. He was just piling in huge quantities of gold and jewels. Everything was going very, very well. And then word comes that a new Spanish fleet has turned up on the coast of Mexico. And that Spanish fleet has not been sent to support Cortes. That Spanish fleet has been sent to attack Cortes because that Spanish fleet has come from his rival, Velasquez, the governor of Cuba, who is jealous at the incredible success of Cortes. So Cortes, he's there in Mexico City. He's, he's left 200 men at the coast. He has three or 400 men in Mexico City. He has to divide that force in Mexico City, send down, leaving only 100 guarding Moctezuma. He marches to the coast, and uh, although the new Spanish force is a thousand strong that has arrived on the coast, again, it's a sign of Cortes' m military skill, he defeats them in battle with his tiny force. And uh, he, over, he, he takes captive their, their uh, general, and um, he absorbs the new Spanish force into his army. Stroke of luck after another. Then he marches back to Mexico City, and there in Mexico City, the Pedro de Alvarado, who is an incredibly cruel Spanish character, a historical character who's also a central figure in my novel, has conducted another massacre. And finally, that's the last straw for the Aztecs, and the Aztecs have risen against him. So when Cortes gets back to Mexico City, he finds his men beleaguered, surrounded by a huge Aztec force. He does relieve them, but five days later, the Spanish are expelled from Mexico City. Uh, they lose 600 men that night. Remember, their army has been reinforced by this new army at the coast that Cortes has just defeated. And it's called the Sad Night, the Noche Triste in Spanish. And uh, cut a long story short, they get out of there, the, the, the 400 survivors. They march back to Tlaxcala, where they lick their wounds for a few months. And then Cortes does this other thing that puts his, his efforts on the scale of Alexander the Great and, and Julius Caesar. He knows that he cannot successfully um, surround and besiege Mexico City because it's an island on a lake at that point unless he has ships. How do you get ships in mountains? Up in the mountains of Tlaxcala, he builds 13 ships. They are called brigantines, each of them capable of carrying 50 or 60 men. He builds them. He tests them out on a lake in the mountains. Then he dismantles them. And then he has them carried by 8,000 Tlaxcalan bearers all the way to the shores of Lake Texcoco, where the Aztec capital stands. And then they're rebuilt. And then the siege of Tenochtitlan begins. And over the next year and a half, there's just a horrific incredible story of battles and warfare
uh, and gradually the Aztecs are, are worn down, and eventually Cortes captures Mexico City, and the conquest is the conquest is over. And key in this is these ships that he has that he has built and transported from the mountains to the to the lake. So it's just an amazing story of human endeavor. It's also a story that changed the face of the world and that shaped the modern world we live in. And that's again where I come back to this issue that we began with of the spiritual forces at work in history. That I I. I I take this seriously. I, I believe that uh, demonic influences uh, have played a role in human behavior, that we are surrounded by invisible supernatural realms, and that in altered states of consciousness we can gain access to these realms, and that there are, that the ancient idea of angels and demons has merit to it, and uh, that, that human culture uh, has, been, has been terribly influenced by forces of darkness and, and evil. And those forces of darkness were massively at work in the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Just 20 years later, the same model was applied in the conquest of Peru by Pizarro. And then the whole story of colonialism and slavery and the negative uh, role that the West has played in the world took shape because of that. If Moctezuma had been a different man and had been able to defeat Cortes and had been able to mobilize allies and defeat Cortes, the whole history of the world, absolute turning point in human history, everything that we see in the modern world and in the relationship between, between the, 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 the rich countries of, of Europe and the rest of the world that went down from there, including the, the, the terrible genocide of Native American Indians in North America, uh, that followed over the subsequent hundreds of years, all of this was a direct follow-on from the conquest of Mexico. So this is why I felt that it was a key story to, to write a novel about and why I felt it was important to get into the supernatural as well as the purely historical aspects of the story. It was a, it was a, truly, it was a, truly, remarkable, <coughs> it was a truly remarkable period of history. And it hasn't really been, it hasn't really been covered in a, in a novel uh, before. Um, there is a there is a great novel called Aztec by Gary Jennings, but it deals primarily with the with the.